Happy Passover or Feast of Unleavened Bread, depending on when you are watching this or when you are celebrating. Shalom, welcome to Blood of the Lamb Ministries. I am Lee. And I am Catherine. We're so glad that you could join us again for our second show here on Lamb Network TV. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. For those who joined us last week, thank you for returning this week. As first shows go, we think we did okay, could have been better. Could have been a lot worse. <laughs> So really, a deep thank you to those who are returning. We were very ill last week and it was a very difficult build up to the show. We could barely get out of bed. So it wasn't what we were hoping for, but it was the best we could offer given the circumstances. So we thank you very much for sticking with us. A very special thank you to Mark Smith for giving us this opportunity and for the supporting us behind the scenes. He does an incredible amount and you just wouldn't know it. <laughs> yeah, to those who don't know that Mark is the main man around here, He's the owner of Lamb Network TV. And a wonderful man that he is too. And he's been doing it for 10 years now, which is just incredible. And if you check out some of the other shows available on Lamb, you will see they have a huge variety of things to offer. They have lots of different opinions, and none of that would be possible without the heart that Mark has to serve you and to spread the word in many different ways it comes. So, as it's Passover season, we have some interesting things on offer for you tonight. But first off, we're going to ask that you all share some things with us. You can get, leave us some comments. About how your Passover went or how your preparations are going, if you haven't um, had Passover yet, depending on the calendar you follow and where you are in the world. Disclaimer, we do not care what calendar you are. We only care that you have the heart that wants to serve the Most High and keep all of his commands. Yeah, so during this show... We'll show you some pictures from our Pesach and post your comments on the screen. If you would like to, you can email us a picture of your Passover or your preparations um, during the studies at bloodofthelandministries.blm at gmail.com and we will show those on the show too. We'll have it coming across at the bottom in a bit, so don't worry about remembering that email. So right now let's pray before we start. Okay, I'm going to lead us in prayer today, is that okay? Of course it is. Our Father Yahweh, Abba Yah, the one who was, who is, and who will always be. Father, we thank you. We thank you for just filling our hearts today. We thank you for your Passover. We thank you for the blood of the Lamb, the precious Passover Lamb that is Yahushua HaMashiach, who has died that our sins may be forgiven us. For he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we healed and made whole. And Father, today we just know that the blood on our door is the blood of the Lamb. Father, we thank you for this for Pesach, and we thank you. We thank you for remembering, for helping us to remember all that you did as we left Mitzrayim, Egypt, as we went on our Exodus, Father, the first time. Father, we just pray that you will be with us as you are leading us on an, an Exodus out of Babylon now spiritually. Father, we just ask that you be with us tonight. May your words be in our mouths and may the people listening learn something new today. Father, we thank you in so many ways. In Yahushua's mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> so first up tonight, we want to bring you a song from another independent artist. Rebecca Hazelton, uh, she produced this song alongside her husband, Ronald, and good friend, James Block, whilst visiting Israel. Rebecca and Ronald, her husband, will be doing the vocals. Rebecca is also playing the piano, the violin, sorry, and James provided the guitar and piano. And all the pictures featured on here are from their trips to Israel. So we'll share that with you now and we hope you really enjoy it.
we really hope that you enjoyed that song um i do believe someone's told us having, they had a few problems hearing it so if you just let us know in the comments and we'll see what we can do about that maybe we'll play it again so um that song is very pleasant and soothing and if you'd like to hear it again You'll find it on Rebecca Hazelton's channel, R Hazelton. I'll post a link in the live chats now and comments after the show. Lee, what study do you have to share with us today? Uh, well, I'll be going into looking into the oranges of Easter, and we'll be looking at whether it matters if we keep Passover or Easter, whether we can choose which one we want to keep. Uh, and more importantly, what Yahushua kept and what Scripture tells us to keep. So um yeah, sorry about the sound. We'll try and uh, we'll try and get that on later with the sound playing. So Catherine, what about you? What are you gonna be keep what are you gonna be discussing tonight? I'm going to be inviting you all to join me at a Galilean wedding. So Lee, I can't wait to hear what you have uncovered. So take it away if you would, please. Okay, let's put this up Hang on with us one second, we'll be with you. Put it in full screen. Sorry, <laughs> just bear with us one second. We're having a lot of those technical difficulties again here tonight, aren't we? We certainly are. But we would, you know, bear with us as we learn. <laughs> so. It's coming, and it's worth the wait. Oh, I hope so. No pressure. <laughs> so, so today we'll be looking at Passover or Easter. And to start off, we must look at the scripture first given to us in Exodus. So chapter 12. And Yahweh spoke unto El Moshe and El Haron in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the assembly of Yasharel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the house will be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbour next unto the house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats. And he shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole multitude of the assembly of Yasharel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take the blood and strike it upon the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And it continues now to verse 14. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and matzah, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, its head with his legs, and with the pertinent thereof and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and that which remains of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and with your staff in your hand ye shall eat it in haste it is Yahweh's Pesach for I will pass through the land of Mitzrayim this night and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim both man and beast and against all the Elohai of Mitzrayim I will execute judgment I am Yahweh and the blood shall be to you for a mark upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Mitzrayim. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So we see that the Passover or Pesach was commanded to Moshe. And it was commanded to keep forever. We must ask ourselves, what did Yahushua do? Was the Pesach or Passover kept by our Messiah? So we'll, for this, we will look at Luke chapter 22. However, it is supported in all four Gospels. So verse 7. And at beginning of daylight hours of the Pesach week, when the Pesach must be killed, he sent Kepha and Yehokadon, saying, Go and prepare us the Pesach that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where will we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall be a, 
shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water? Follow him into the house where he enters in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, the rabbi says unto you, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Pesach with my Talmudim? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Pesach. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Pesach with you before I suffer. So we see there that Yahushua did keep it. So Yahushua kept the Passover or Pesach with his disciples before his death. So now we must ask ourselves, where does Easter come from and can it be found in Scripture? So when people talk about this, they will bring up Acts chapter 12, and we'll look at that now. Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to fetch certain of the called out assembly, and he killed Yaakov, the brother of Jehokanim, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Yahudim, he proceeded further to take Kepha also. Then were the days of Matzah. So we are given a time frame here of when this event takes place, and it was at the time of Matzah or unleavened bread. Now the next verse is what people bring up when talking about Easter. And the translation we are looking at first is from the Sefer. So it says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quatrains of soldiers to keep him, intending after Pesach to bring him forth to the people. However, in other English translations, such as the KJV, it reads, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him up to the four quarterings of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So here we see it has been, tra been translated as Easter and Pesach. So what we must do is look at the word that has been translated. So the word that's translated is G3957. And it says, and it is pronounced Pascha. Pascha. So when we look at the definition of it, we will see one, the Pascal sacrifice, which was a custom which was accustomed to be offered for the people's deliverance of old from Egypt. The Pascal lamb, the lamb the Israelites were accustomed to slay and eat on the 14th day of the first month of the year. The Pascal supper. And the Pascal feast, the feast of the Passover extending from the 14th to the 20th day of the first month. So the word has been translated 29 times in the KJV. However, this is the only occurrence where it's been, tra been translated as Easter. The remaining 28 times it has been translated to Passover. So we see that it's only this one time we see it as Easter. So what is Easter then? And where does the tradition, tradition come from? We ask ourselves a lot, Why do bun what do bunnies and eggs have to do with Yahusha? It's believed that rabbits, bunnies, hares all represent fertility, and therefore the use of a bunny and an egg, we see the resurrection of Yahusha. This was adopted by the Christian and Catholic Church and is viewed as an innocent practice by the majority of believers. But what is the truth? And that is what we'll be trying to look at tonight. On the Britannica website, we are told that the name of Easter is derived from a pagan fertility goddess. And I got this extract from the website of Britannica with a link there at the end. And it says, the English word Easter, which parallels the German word Ostern, is of uncertain origin. One view expounded by the Venerable Bade is the eight, in the 8th century was that it derived from Estore or Estra the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility. This view presumes, as does the view associating the origins of Christmas on December 25th with pagan celebrations of the winter solstice, that Christians appropriated pagan names and holidays for their highest festivals. So do we have any more support for this? On catholic.org, it states, the English term, according to the Vere Vere, relates to Estra, a Teutonic goddess of the rising light of day and spring, which deity, however, is otherwise unknown. 
even in the Edda, Anglo-Saxon Easter, Estron, Hold High German, Ostra, Ostara, Osterin, and German, Ostern. And that is from Catholic Online, catholic.org, again with the link below. From the website First Century Christian, we read, Easter is a pagan holiday that has morphed its way into Christianity. It was originally a holiday for the fertility goddess Estore, or Diana of Ephesus, in the Book of Acts. Rabbits are notorious for breeding, hence the Easter bunnies. Easter Sunday is supposed to be the day that Christ, or Mashiach, was resurrected, but even that part isn't true either. And we get this from First Century Christian, an article called Easter is Pagan. And from the website, The Truth Unveiled, it describes how it originated from Babylon and Nimrod. So the original Easter festival celebrated was a, I'll let you read that, that commemorated the return of life via the fertility goddess, the conception of Tammuz. People who followed and worshipped Nimrod celebrated the conception of Tammuz on the first Sunday after the full moon that followed the spring equinox. And as mentioned, that comes from The Truth Unveiled, and their article Easter is pagan and not holy. So there we have many, many articles that tell us that Easter was a pagan practice. So we will look now at the story of Nimrod, his wife Semiramis, and their son Tam and her son Tammuz. So Nimrod was married to Semiramis, who was his mother. It is believed that he was the father of many pagan practices. He was worshipped and revered as a sun god and is known through scriptures as Baal and Molech. Once he died, Semiramis claimed that she had miraculously become pregnant through the spirit of Nimrod. And we'll look later about that claim. She said that she was a moon goddess who descended to earth in an egg. Semiramis is also known as the Queen of Babylon, the Queen of Heaven, or Ishtar, among many other names. Her child Tammuz was born on December 25th and perceived as a reincarnation of Nimrod. At the age of 40, Tammuz was killed by a wild boar. And Semiramis would later be represented as a pagan fertility goddess. And this all began at the Tower of Babel. And we will see now what pagan practices came from this and what would follow. So they would make, they would bake cakes to the Queen of Heaven and for Tammuz and would place a T or a cross on the cakes as a representation for Tammuz. They would have rituals where many women would be impregnated. These women who conceived would give birth during the winter solstice. Disgustingly, though, those babies would be sacrificed at the next ritual or Easter ceremony where they would be only several months old. It really is disgusting. These priests would then use the blood from the murdered babies to dye or paint eggs as a symbol of Semiramis and fertility. Semiramis proclaimed that following the death of Tammuz, that they would have 40 days of sorrow and mourning that would be leading up to this day. And during this time, there would be no meat eaten. And as it was a wild boar that killed Tammuz, on this day, they would eat a ham or pork. And worshippers would also meditate on Baal or Tammuz and would place a T or cross on their foreheads or right hands. And when we look at these, that was introduced during the time of Semiramis. We see many of them present today. Now, I won't mention anything, but I'm sure that you can deduce and use your own imaginations or looking at these to, to see what I'm talking about. So can we see evidence of this worship in scripture? So we will look now, and first we'll look at Ezekiel. Chapter 8, verses eight, 13 to 18. So he said, He said also unto me, Turn yet again, and you shall see a greater abomination than they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahweh's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz, 
Then said he unto me, Have you seen this, O son of Adam? Turn yet again, and you shall see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of Yahweh's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of Yahweh, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs turned to the temple of Yahweh, and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Have you seen this, O son of Adam? Is it a light thing to the house of Yahudah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, while I also deal in fury, my eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And through their cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. So during this time of Ezekiel, we see that the people were still following after these pagan practices. We see that it states that the women were weeping for Tammuz. Semiramis, his mother, installed this period of mourning and weeping for her dead son. We also see that the temple, at the temple of Yahweh, there are men that are worshipping the sun. These men have their backs turned towards the temple, their backs turned towards Yah and are facing and worshipping the sun. As we said, Nimrod was viewed as a sun god. And we have this sun worship in place. We see an example of this, Baal and sun worship by Yasharel before they enter the promised land. And for this, we see in Numbers chapter 25, and Yasharel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifice of their Elohim, and the people did eat and bowed down to their Elohim. And Yasharel joined himself into Baal Peor, and the anger of Yahuwah was kindled against Yasharel. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before Yahuwah against the sun, that the fierce anger of Yahuwah may be turned away from Yasharel. So this event occurred when Bilam was unable to curse the people. There he places a stumbling block for them to curse themselves. Every time in the previous chapters, every time he tries to curse Yasharel at the command of Balak, Yahweh turns it into a blessing. So he tells them to place a stumbling block and allow them to curse themselves. Yah's people commit these whoredoms with the people of these other nations. They eat their unclean foods and worship their Elohims. They practice sun worship, and that is why we see Yah command them to be hung against the sun. Now, if we look at Jeremiah chapter 7, we read verses 17, first through to 20. See ye not what they do in the cities of Yahuda and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead the dough to make sacrificial wafers to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings into their other Elohim that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says Yahweh? Do they, pro do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus says Yahweh, Adonai Yahweh, behold, my anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast and upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn. And shall not be quenched. And then if we look at verses 23 and 24. It says. But this thing commanded I, I them saying. Obey my voice and I will be your Elohim. And ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you. That it may be well with you. But they hearken not nor incline their ear. But walked in the counsels. And in the imaginations of their evil heart. And went backwards. And not forwards. So here in Jeremiah. We see that the women are making cakes for the queen of heaven. This queen of heaven would be Semiramis or Ishtar, among many other names. We see that these practice, practices anger Yah. The people have chosen to walk in the ways of the nations. They have walked in the imaginations of their evil hearts and disregarded the commands of Yah. So do we have any more mention of this queen of heaven in scripture? In Judges chapter 2 verse 13, it says, And they forsook Yahweh and served Baal and Ashtaroth. 
in Judges 10, 6, it says, And the children of Yashorel did evil again in the sight of Yahweh, and served Baalim and Ashtaroth, and the Elohai of Aram, and the Elohai of the Zidon, and the Elohai of Moab, and the Elohai of the children of Ammon, and the Elohai of the Pelashim, and forsook Yahweh, and served not him. 1 Samuel 12.10 it reads, And they cried unto El Yahweh, and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken Yahweh, and served Baalami and Ashtaroth, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve you. And in 1 Kings 11.5, For Shalomah or Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the Elohai of the Zidamim, and after Malcolm, the abomination of the Ammonim. So we have several scriptures there where we hear this Ashtaroth. So we will look at this word. We see it's H6252, Ashtaroth. And it, Brown Driver Diggs, Briggs def, defines it as Ashtaroth or Ashtaroth as a star. And also we read false goddess in the Canaanite religion, usually related to fertility cult. And we can see that this was linked, this worship was linked with child sacrifice. In 2 Kings 17, 16 and 17, we read, And they left all the commandments of Yahweh Elohim and made them molten images and two calves and made an Ashtoreth pole and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divinations and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of Yahweh to provoke him to anger. So we see this fertility worship fertility cult, fertility goddess, and child sacrifice linked again. Yah has warned us to, walk, to not walk in the footsteps of the other nations and copying their ways and worshipping Yah in the same. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, we read, When Yahweh shall cut off the nations from before you, wherever you go to possess them, and you succeed them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you be not snared by following them after they be destroyed and before you, and that they, you inquire not after their Elohim, saying, How did these nations serve their Elohim? So, even so, will I do likewise. You shall not do so unto Yahweh, for every abomination to Yahweh which he hates have they done to their Elohim, for even the sons and their daughters have they burnt in the fire to their Elohim. What thing soever I command you, God, to do it, you shall not add thereof, nor diminish from it. We have more confirmation of this in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 14. When you are come into the land which Yahweh Hekah gives you, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or one that practices sorcery, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that they do, these things are abominations unto Yahweh. And because of these abominations, Yahweh el drives them out before you. You shall be perfect with Yahweh el For these nations which you shall possess hearkened unto sorcerers and unto diviners. But as for you, Yahweh el has not suffered you to do so. And again, we will see in Deuteronomy 7. When Yahweh Achakim shall bring you into the land wherever you go to possess it, and has cast out many nations before you, the Shittim and the Girgazim and the Emerim and the Kenaim and the Perizim and the Shivim and the Uvalim, seven nations greater and mightier than you, and when Yahweh Achakim shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them, and you shall cut no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shall you make marriages with them. Your daughter shall not give unto their sons, nor his daughter shall you take unto your son. For they will turn away your son from following me, that they may serve other Elohims. So will the anger of Yahweh be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their Ashtoreth poles and burn their graven images with fire. So we see that all these pagan religions have fertility goddess worship. And I have put on us this slide here, this diagram, and it is from New to Torah. 
A screenshot taken from the new Torah video, evidence proving that Ishtar and Easter are the same goddess. The YouTube link there below. And if you want to take a picture of it and look at it, it links there all the other ancient religions, the name of their fertility goddess, and then it has the same, the attributes, the links between each of them. And you see that there is this fertility in the springtime, eggs, connections with many of them. And we have sunrise on there as well. So we have many connections with them. So do we have any evidence that Passover then was celebrated after Yahushua and by his earliest believers? In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we read, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are matzah, for even Mashiach, our Pesach, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, lest us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the matzah of sincerity and truth. So here we have Paul referring to Yahusha being our Passover lamb. And we have reference to leaven and matzah. So we see that they were still talking about Passover. They were keeping Passover after Yahusha's death. We also have our Messiah, Yahusha himself, referring to this leaven. Matthew chapter 16, we read, Then Yahusha said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the parashim and the Zadanim. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? Which when Yahushua perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason you among yourselves, because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets you took up? How is it ye do not understand that I spoke it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the parashim and the zadaim? Then understand they how they bode them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the parashim and of the zedaim. So then, when did Easter replace Passover? In 325 AD, at the first council of Nicaea, they established a day of Easter as the first Sunday after the full moon following the March equinox. And this excerpt now is taken from Eusebius, Life of Constantine, Book 3, Chapter 18, and it Emperor Constantine wrote, It appeared an unworthy thing that in the celebration of this most holy feast we should follow the practice of the Jews, who have impiously defiled their hands with erroneous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted with blindness of soul. Let us have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our saviour a different way. So prior to this, the Romans worshipped Cybele and her lover slash son Attis. So during this pagan festival, so Cybele and Attis represent the Babylonian Ishtar and Nimrod, just giving a new name. And this is from the website, Come About My People. And we see that the Catholic Church really didn't want anything to do with the biblical ways. So Constantine and the Roman Church wanted to abolish the biblical practices and feast days. We see this with the changing of the Sabbath to a Sunday. And this now is taken from T. Enright, Bishop of St. Alphonus Church in St. Louis, Missouri, June 1905. It reads, it was the Catholic Church which made the law obligating us to keep Sunday holy. The Church made this law long after the Bible was written. Hence said law is not in the Bible. The Catholic Church abolished not only the Sabbath, but all the other Jewish festivals. Therefore, they outlawed the holy feast days of the Bible, and then they blended their pagan festivals and practices and beliefs with our Messiah. This is why when you look deep into these, until their holy days, you can see paganism deep rooted. And again, that is from the website comeoutofher.org, those excerpts. They also installed the practice of Resurrection Sunday. The Sunday is a new day of worship to commemorate that our Messiah rose on this day, they say. 
But does scripture support this? In Mark chapter 16, we read, And when the Sabbath passed, Miram, uh, Miriam um, of Midgal and Miriam, the mother of Jacob and Shaloma, having gone to the market and brought sweet spices in order to come and anoint him. And very early in the morning of that one Sabbath, they came to make a memorial at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garment, and they were frightened. And he said unto them, Be not frightened, ye seek Yahushua the Netzeri, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. So that was from Mark. We read now in John chapter 20. Now on the certain Shabbat come Miriam um, of Midgal early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre, and saw the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she ran and came to Shimon Kepha, and the other Talmudim, who Yashushar loved, and said unto them, They have taken away Adonai out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. In Luke 24 we read, Now on the one Sabbath, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and, other, and certain others with them. And they found the stall rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of Adonai Yahushar. And finally, in Matthew chapter 28, we read, But late in the day of the Sabbath, as it began to grow light, to that one Sabbath to come, came Miriam of Megal, and the other Miriam, and beheld the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of Yahweh descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, had his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Yahushua, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come, see the place where Adonai lay. So we see there all four Gospels supporting that Yahushua had risen before the sun had even rose. It was still dark when they came to the sepulchre and he was not there. He rose while it was still dark, during which would have been first fruits. This is the first day after the weekly Sabbath, after the Pesach. And it is in Leviticus 23 where we're given the commands for this. Verse, verse 10, it says, Speak unto the children of Yasharel and say unto them, When shall you come into the land which I give you? You shall reap the harvest thereof, and you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest unto the priest. And you shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And this verse is preceded by the command of the Passover in verses 4 to 8. We are told that Yahushua is our first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Mashiach risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam all die, even so Mashiach shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Mashiach the first fruits, afterward they that are Mashiachs at his coming. So therefore we see that as our first fruits, he must have been resurrected on first fruits. And as the Gospels tell us, before it was light and when it was still dark. On Resurrection Sunday or Easter, or Easter Sunday, some churches would have a sunrise service. They discuss it here at this website, umc.org, a celebration of resurrection, Easter sunrise services. Also, while researching this topic, I came across an article where Christians were discussing the Easter morning sun dance. Now, this would be where Christian believers would go out while it was still dark and they would wait for the sun to rise and while the sun rose they would dance and shout and sing to commemorate and celebrate Yahushua's resurrection and that's the website for that that where the article is located we see that sun, the sun would become a symbol for the false gods first starting 
with Nimrod. So in this article, for a short time, the practice of this counterfeit religion ceased, but Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, had a brilliant idea of how she could successfully revive her and Nimrod's pagan religion and give it a new form. It was not long after the death of her husband that Semiramis became pregnant. She said that when Nimrod died, he went up to the sun, and the sun then became a symbol of Nimrod. And she actually says that a ray of sun made her pregnant. And that comes from the website, the Ten Commandments.org. We see that during the Roman times, these sun god qualities would be applied to the false perception they had of Yahusha. So during the latter periods of Roman history, some worship gained in importance and, and ultimately led to what has called a solar monotheism. Nearly all the gods of the period were supposed were, proposed, were possessed of solar qualities, and both Christ and Mithra acquired the traits of solar de- uh, deities. And that again is from Britannica, some worship, origin, history, symbols, and facts. So we can see that Resurrection Sunday and worshipping at the rising of the sun has some links with this Babylonian sun worship from Nimrod. So Yahushua is the Passover and his life and death is the fulfillment of this feast. John 1, 29 tells us the next day Yehokanin sees Yahushua coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of Elohim, which takes away the sin of the world. 1 Peter 1, 19 says, but with the precious blood of Mashiach as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And as we've uh, spoke of before, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you made a new lump, as ye are a matzah, for even Mashiach or Pesach is sacrificed for us. We read of Yahushua and his death also in Isaiah or Yeshiyahu chapter 53. So we read in verse 4 to 10. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of Elohim and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes are we healed. All like sheep we have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He has taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He has put him to grief, when you shall make his soul an offering for sin, He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. So we see there Yahshiahu talking, referring to Yahusha as a lamb that would take our sins upon himself. And we must remember that we are chosen by Yah. In Deuteronomy 7 verses 6 to 11 it says, For ye are a holy people unto Yahweh Hekah. Yahweh Hekah has chosen you to be a special people unto him, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Yahweh did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because Yahweh loved you, and because he would guard the oath which he had sworn seven oaths unto your fathers, has Yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Mitzrayim. Now, therefore, that Yahweh Hekah, he is Elohim, the faithful El, which guards his covenant and mercy with them that love him and guard his commandments to a thousand generation. He repays them that hate him to his face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore guard the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command you this day to do them. So when we look at the words for holy and special, we see that they defined as H6918, Kadesh, which is defined as sacred, holy, holy one, saint, or set apart. When we look at special, it's H5459, Segula, which is defined as possession, property, also valued property, peculiar, treasure, and treasure. 
So we see we are to be a set apart treasure to you. We just remember that we have been chosen by you, called out by you to be a set apart people, his peculiar treasure that has come out of the world, out of Mitzrayim. Exodus 19.5 Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and guard my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which ye shall speak unto the children of Yasharel. Deuteronomy 14.2 For you are a holy people unto Yahweh and Yahweh, Yahweh has chosen you to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon the earth and psalm 135 4 for yah has chosen yaakov unto himself and yasharel for his peculiar treasure and then we read in malachi chapter 3 16 then they that feared yahweh spoke often one to another and yahweh hearkened and heard it and a sefer of record was written before him for them that feared yahweh and that fought upon his name and they shall be mine, says Yahweh Sevaot. In the day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves Elohim and him that serves him not. So here in Malachi, Yahweh's people are called his jewels. First Peter 2 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into the marvellous light. So we must ensure that we come out of living in this world, believing that we can serve and worship how we want to and not as we have been commanded. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that, what is that good and accept one perfect will of Elohim. And 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of Elohim abides forever. And Revelation 18.4 and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye not be partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And we were told that the path would be narrow by Yahusha. Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore all things whatsoever you, whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the Torah of the, and the prophets. Enter ye at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because narrow is the gate and troublesome is the way which leads to life, and few there, and few there be that find it. So the Pesach Passover was to be for Yah's people throughout all their lives. We read this in Exodus 12, 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And Exodus 13, 9. And it shall be for a sign unto you upon your hand, and for a memorial between your eyes. And Yahweh's Torah may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand has Yahweh brought you out of Mitzrayim. And interestingly, we see that this day was to be a sign. And we will end this study now by just looking at this word for sign. So the word for sign is H226 and it's Oath. We see that it's spelled Aleph, Vav, Tav. The Aleph and the Tav represent the Aleph Bet, the language of Yahweh and all the words used for creation. With Aleph being the first and Tav being the last. And we know that Yahusha was the word used for creation. We get this from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and Elohim was the word. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Yahusha refers to himself as the Aleph and Tav. In Revelation 1.8 it says, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. 
says Yahweh Elohim, which is and which was and which is to come, Yahweh Seva O. So the letter Vav is the tent peg or nail used to add or secure things, but also is the instrument used to pierce our Messiah, our Pesach Lamb, Yahusha. So when we look at this word, we see that the Pesach is a sign of the suffering of Messiah that he would endure for our salvation. We see that the Aleph and the Tav is, is pierced with the valve, was pierced with the nail. So it is a picture of what is to happen to Yahusha and how we would receive our salvation. So in closing, we are to keep Passover as a sign and we are to come out of the world and not keep the world's ways. So in ending, it is important that we keep Passover and not Easter. So thank you very much. Well, Lee, that was very interesting. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm still recovering from our illness. <laughs> Um, that was really interesting. So I didn't really realize just how much they've pulled the wool over our eyes, how much they've led us down paths that are very far away from Yahweh and his ways. No, they certainly have. Um, we must be careful in what we decide to and how we praise our Heavenly Father. We hear people telling us it doesn't matter what the origins are, if it's pagan or not, because they've Christianized it. We hear uh, Yah knows our hearts and that we are worshipping him. But he clearly tells us in Deuteronomy not to worship him as the other nations do and how they serve their Elohims. So we must be careful and ensure that everything we do lines up with Scripture and with our Messiah, Yahushua. I totally agree. It's, it's very difficult. Isn't it, it is. So now we will come to the middle of our show and we will be looking at Passover pictures and comments. So I do want to just warn everybody, say to everybody, this one is meant to have no sound. So <laughs> <laughs> don't be uh, thinking there's no sound, there's no sound. It's not meant to have any sound, okay? Um, but I hope you enjoy, as we have had quite a number in. That one, just hang on one second for me, everybody. Because I did make you a little video of all of them, but I'm not getting it coming up now. Okay, here we go. so we hope you all enjoyed seeing those lovely celebrations from around the world and and if, sorry if you wanted to send the picture but didn't have time today or haven't celebrated your passover yet if you send them to us we'll do our best to get them on the show next week 
Again, email us at bloodofthelandministries.blm at gmail.com and we'll feature you uh, your Passover on the next show. So, Catherine, may I join you today on a wedding journey that you're about to take us on? Of course you can. That would be wonderful. So, here we go, my lovelies. We're just, I'm just going to make sure that that email's up at the bottom again for everybody. Okay, so the marriage supper of the Lamb and his bride. Now, you will have to all bear with me as I do still have some throat issues. <laughs> okay. Revelation 19.7 let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his woman has made herself ready. At the coming of our Messiah, there is to be a wedding, a marriage. Marriages and ceremonies are spoken of many times throughout the scriptures in both the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the Brit Hadashah, the Renewed Covenant, or the New Testament, as you may know it. John 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Yahushua was there. And both Yahushua was called and his Talmudim to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Yahushua said unto him, They have no more wine. Yahushua said unto her, Woman, what is this to me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And there were set their six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Yahudim, containing two or three measures apiece. Yahushua said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bore it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning sets forth good wine, and when the men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. At the beginning of his ministry, Yahushua and those that were with him were called to a wedding. It was here that Yahushua performed what some would call his first miracle. He turned water into wine. Being a good host is Torah. In Leviticus 19.33, we read, And if a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For ye were strangers in the land of Mitzrayim. I am Yahuwah, Elohim. So running out of what was needed for the guests would have been seriously frowned upon. Yahushua saved them from a big embarrassment. Now, we will not be getting into the wine debate. Was it? Was it not? Should we be drinking? We won't be getting into whose wedding this was. In fact, we won't even be focusing on this at all. But I want you all to realise that a wedding ceremony, a Galilean wedding ceremony, would have been a regular occurrence for the followers of Messiah Yahushua and those around him. Also, Yahushua used a wedding event in two of his parables. Matthew 22, 2. And the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entered them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he set forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore to the highways, and as many ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out to the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. 
And when the king came to see the guests, he saw that there was a man which had not a wedding garment on. And he said unto him, Friend, how come you you in hither have, having not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. <coughs> Sorry, I do apologise. And the, again, in another parable, Matthew 25, 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil on their vessels with the lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they slumbered and slept. And at midnight was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. Lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Adonai, Adonai, open to us. But he answered and said, Amen, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch ye therefore, for you are neither the day nor the hour wherewith the son of Adam comes. Yahushua spoke of things that were common knowledge to those around him. So that when he spoke, they understood what he was talking about and could give it some context. They made it real. The word, the, they would understand the point he was trying to make. These two parables are not only are not the only times that a wedding that wedding talk would be used by our Messiah. For us to fully understand what I mean, we must first understand a Galilean wedding. The way one of these ancient weddings happened is very different to what we are accustomed to today. First off, there was the betrothal. The betrothal was a bit like an engagement period in our way of thinking, but more binding. A divorce would have been needed to break this. Once a bride was found for a young man, he and his father would write up a contract outlining the terms of the marriage. A dowry was also included in this. This was not to buy the bride, but to provide her family with a means to look after their daughter should anything happen to her husband. Once the contract was written up, the dowry ready, the young man and his father would go and visit the family of the woman that he wished to marry. Once at the young lady's home, the contract would be read and the dowry given. The young man would then pour a cup of wine, drink from it and offer it to his bride-to-be. If the bride-to-be took the cup and drank, this would signify that she'd accepted the proposal. This act made a covenant. She could refuse by not taking of the cup. The final decision lay with her. If the bride-to-be accepted the cup, and drank the wine, then the groom would announce, I will not drink of this cup again until I am with you in my father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. After all of this, the bride and groom would then not see each other again until the groom had all ready. This would take approximately 12 months. So during the wait... During this time, the groom would build a room on his father's house for himself and his bride-to-be. He would also gather all that would be needed for the wedding feast. If someone asked when the wedding would be, the groom would answer, only my father knows the day or the hour. This was because only his father could determine when all was ready. The bride during this time would prepare herself, baking her dress and keeping herself pure. Her and her bridesmaids would always need to be ready. They would also need to have an oil lamp trimmed, filled with oil and by their beds. The reason for this was the groom could come at any time 
and they often came in the middle of the night. The Wedding Feast Once the father of the groom was satisfied his son had done all that was needed, his son would then wait for him to tell him and tell this son would then wait for him to tell him to fetch his bride. When that time came, the son and his groomsmen would be woken in the middle of the night by the father. They would grab the shofar and make a procession down the street, shouting and making a great noise, waking the wedding guests and sounding the alarm for the bride to be. Only those guests that were ready and waiting could run out of their houses and join the wedding procession. If the bride was ready, she would grab her lamp and go out of her house and be waiting in the street for her coming husband. Once the groom and the wedding procession reached the waiting bride, the bride would then be carried to, in a special chair to the groom's father's house and the room he had prepared. All of those that were ready and had joined the procession would enter the father's house. The door would then be shut behind them and none could enter in or go out. The wedding feast would then proceed and last for seven days. Now that we know how a Galilean wedding played out, Let's look at what our Messiah Yahushua had to say and see if the two are comparable. The first question that we should ask is, can we even associate Yahushua and weddings? Considering his first miracle brings to our attention a Galilean wedding and he spoke of them in parables, I would say it is something we should certainly consider. But wait, there is more. Yahushua is the Lamb of Yah. Is, as the Lamb of Yah is a name that was given to him many times. John 1, 29. The next day, Yehokanon sees Yahushua coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of Elohim, which takes away the sins of the world. 1 Peter 1, 19. But with the precious blood of Mashiach, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Revelation 5, 12. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessings. And Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Does the Lamb, Yahushua, have a wedding associated with him? Revelation 19, Verse 7 onwards, let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his woman has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the Kodashim. And he said unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true words of Elohim. Now that we have confirmed there is a wedding associated with Yahushua, let's see if anything was said that would be considered marriage talk, keeping a Galilean wedding in mind. One of the first steps in a Galilean wedding was the covenant being made and sealed when the bride accepted by drinking from the same cup of wine that the groom had just drank from. Did this happen when Yahushua came the first time? Matthew 26, 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the renewed covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So the answer is yes. He did share a cup with those around him. So if the bride-to-be accepted the cup that he had offered in our Galilean wedding and drank from it, the groom would then respond, I will not drink of this cup again until I am with you in my father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. Again, do, do we see this with Yahushua? Matthew 26, 29. But I say unto you, 
I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. In my And John 14, 2, in my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So we know Yahusha is the groom, the one who offered the cup and is preparing a place for his bride. But who is that bride? Those who are making themselves ready, lamps full of oil, watching and waiting for the husbandmen to return, those who love him. <clears throat> Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his woman has made herself ready and to her was granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of the Kodashim. Revelation 7, 14 And I said unto him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which guard the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yahushua Hamashiach. John 14, 21, he that has my commandments and guards them, he it is that loves me and he that loves me shall be loved of my father and I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. John 14, 15, if you love me, guard my commandments. So now we know who his bride is. So when the people asked the groom back at our Galilean wedding, when was the wedding? He replied, only my father knows the day or the hour. Do we see this again in scripture? Mark 13, 32, but of that day and that hour knows no man, no not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but my Father only. Matthew twenty four thirty six. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But what we do know, the wedding feast of the Lamb happens at the time of the end and at the second coming of our Messiah, Yahushua. Some will say that when Yahushua said this, he was actually talking about Yom Teruah. As the feast falls on a new moon and we do not always know when this will be. Once the time came for the son to collect his bride, he would proceed with a shofar blast and a great noise sounding the alarm to his bride and all those that wish to attend. Do we see this in scripture? 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the shofar shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for Yahuwah himself shall descend from the heavens with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the shofar of Elohim, and the dead in Mashiach shall rise first. Matthew 24, 31, and he shall send his angel with a great sound of the shofar, in your version it might say trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So all those who were ready at the call came and joined the wedding feast and the door was closed. And again, Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your royal, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door 
was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgin, saying, Adonai, Adonai, open to us. But he answered and said, Amen, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the son of Adam comes. How can we be ready so that we can be part of the wedding supper of the Lamb? Number one, watch. Matthew 25, 13. Watch ye therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Luke 12, 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Adonai, when he comes, shall find watching. Amen, I say unto you, that he, sh that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Luke 12, 38. And if, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those ser servants. Verse 39. And know this, that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. In verse 40, be ye therefore ready also, for the son of Adam comes at an hour when you think not. Number two, know the signs of the times. These are found in verses like Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13 and all of Revelation. But they're also found all over the scriptures. When we know the scriptures, we can know the time that we are living in. And number three, have our lamps ready, full of oil, glowing with light. The parable of the ten virgins told us the wise were the ones who had their lamps filled with oil. A lamp, Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp. Light, Proverbs 6.23 also, and the law, the Torah, is light. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And oil, Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 3. Because of the savour of thy good ointments, thy name, thy name, Yahweh, Yah, is an ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Don't ever forget, this is an open invitation. All are invited, all are welcome. You only need to choose to be a part of the service. Here is your invitation to the marriage supper at the Lamb. It was at the Passover that Yahusha offered his cup. Will you take and drink of it? Hag Pesach Samaic, everybody. Wow, that was beautiful. Yeah, just the thought of being that bride waiting for Yahushua's return is, is wonderful. And it makes you realise that everything he said, every word he spoke, every parable he said and told us, it all had meaning and it all... When we... Sometimes you find it difficult when we're in this this mindset today, this 21st century Western mindset. We find it difficult. But when we can get into the mind of the people, of the times, of when Yahushua lived, it truly is incredible to see it. Just just everything about that is so beautiful. The cup, preparing the house, it all just makes so much sense. And it is just wonderful to hear. So thank you very much for that. Very welcome. So I, I believe... Uh, about that song with the difficulty well before. i might actually be able to show you the song because we, we do have. have some time left if you just give me a moment everybody now i don't i think it is just sound and i don't know if i know how to share that with you so if you just give me a minute and i can see what i can do <laughs> Oh, about that. I just talked then about your uh, 
your study really is it's wonderful that you know the parables of the the oil the the shofars just every part of it and when you link it to that galilean wedding it just it just oh your mind just goes crazy just thinking about it all <laughs> really just how much all makes sense and like you said the first miracle he performed was at a galilean wedding it, it was and you know those things that you are which has hidden that we just don't understand and we we find it difficult in today's world but we need to sometimes we need to strip away everything we need to go back to how it was back then and then we can truly understand the word and the beauty in it and we just praise Yah and Yahushua for revealing these truths to us it's it's wonderful it certainly is now as I think I may be able to share it with you but as I say it will only be sound and no picture this time but we got both there in the end if we <laughs> can manage it so just try and remember the video I watched before um except I can't see it if you play it, would it just play? It's not shared, though, is it? No. Oh. <clears throat> All right, everybody, I tried hard, but I can't do it. So we just will leave it. And uh, what we will do is we'll read you a couple of the Psalms for Pesach before we, we leave. And we'll try our best to get that song on for next week because it truly is a lovely song. It's absolutely gorgeous. And... Uh, you, the link is in the comments so if you can copy that link get it up on youtube as soon as we're finished listen to it it's it's a lovely song rivka is very talented and i really do i strongly suggest you listen to it it'll be a sabbath blessing for you I, I, it's, and her violin playing is, is she's got lovely, and on is, yeah. is gorgeous and, and she's got really go a beautiful voice as well out. beautiful voice yeah. as well um so so with it being Passover, Pesach, we'll end now with some of the the uh, the praise psalms as they're, they're called. As we are told that Yahusha um, and his disciples, his Talmudim, did sing after the Pesach. We are told that they sang hymns, but obviously they're psalms. They're psalms. So we'll read some of these to you for our last closing minutes. So I'll begin. Psalm 113. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. O ye servants of Yahuwah. Hallelujah, the name of Yahweh. Blessed be the name of Yahweh from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, Yahweh's name is to be praised. Yahweh is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto Yahweh who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. He rises up the poor out of the dust and lifts up the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He makes the barren women to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. Psalm 114. When Yashorel went out of Mitzrayim, the house of Yahob from a people of strange language, Yahudah was his sanctuary and Yashorel his dominion. The sea saw it and it fled. The Yardon was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams, and the little hills, hills like lambs. What ailed you, O sea, that you fled? You yard on, that you were driven back. Ye mountain, mountains that you skipped like rams, and ye little hills like lambs. Terrible, you earth, all the present, at the presence of Adonai, at the presence of Elohai, of Yahov, which turned back, which turned the rock into a standing stone, the flint into a mountain of, a fountain of waters all right lee that was absolutely lovely oh, we'll have to end it there then so we thank you all for joining us this week and we hope that you enjoyed the various things that we have shared with you be sure to check out some of the other shows here on lamb and if you're not watching on lamb network it might be a good idea too from time to time as you never know when youtube will decide to strike or censor lamb network and so, and why not head over to our own YouTube channel, Blood of the Lamb Ministries? Where we have Torah studies, studies on the women of the word by Catherine, a song from our son and various other videos, all of which will be growing in no number over the weeks to come. Catherine has a study which is coming out tomorrow on Hannah. Um, so if you click for notifications, you'll know when it has arrived. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. 
and spending some of your precious time with us. We are Blood of the Lamb Ministries and we hope to see you again next week. Shalom. Shalom. We are richly blessed to bring you what we believe is the fullest, most diverse, yet up-to-date progressive teachings, discussion, and prayer programming you can find anywhere on this planet. Be sure to take the tour of the MessianicLambRadio.com website. I'm Susan Hoogie, thanking you for joining us on the Messianic Lamb Video Network. Throw